friends, my name is Lindsay and I run the blog Books for Christian Girls and welcome to or welcome back to the little corner of the internet where I talk mainly about Christian fiction. Today it's probably already going to be a chaotic video, like I'm just going to claim it now because I have 14 books to talk about for this recent reads. Some of them, a few of them, very few of them, I really really enjoyed. The other ones, well, I didn't love them and I've got lots of... Lots of different categories, timestamps below, reviews with content info down below. I organize these in genres, feel free to skip around. I think that's it. Let's just go ahead and get started because I have a lot of books. And I think some of them are going to be unpopular opinions. For the young adult category, I have four books and that's historical, fantasy, and then a contemporary book. I'm going to go in lowest to highest rating like I typically do to hopefully end this video out on a good note. The last book I'm going to be talking about is a fabulous, fantastic, one of my all-time favorite books, so I know this video is going to end with fangirling and I love that. But for the young adult category, the first book I have is Dust by Kara Swanson. I know this is gonna, yeah, and you've probably already figured out I gave this a lower rating. I gave this a personal rating of two stars. And honestly, it was a three star for me until like that final chapter. And then I got a glimpse of what so many people say when they talk about this series that it's very dark. I see it, and I'm worried about reading the second book. I am gonna be picking up the second book though just to have it reviewed and to know what happens, but I am trying to prepare myself because I have heard that one is really dark. And I don't like dark books, so we're going to see how that goes. But this is basically kind of a reimagining of Peter Pan. It's not really a retelling because Peter Pan, the actual Peter Pan, is in it. But it's something's happening to Neverland, something's going wrong, and it's all up to this girl named Claire who happens to have what she thinks is a skin condition where her skin flakes off, but is actually pixie dust. And she's hunting for her twin brother that... She thinks might have been taken by Peter Pan and everyone thinks she's crazy, but she goes on this journey to find her brother and to find Peter Pan and lots of things happen. Writing style wise, I was really like, it felt effortless to read, which is such a weird word. I mean, I could say easy, but it really just was such a, a breeze to read. There is the hints, though, of darker things that are going to probably appear in the second book. I do want to give a trigger warning about this book for those who are sensitive to suicidal attempts because the main girl, it is discussed that she did prior try to commit suicide. And so you've got that very hard, hard topic being referenced. And I can't say I really liked how it was portrayed in this book and I think that's another thing to note is that yes this is more clean fiction than Christian fiction but it's being reviewed on BFCG because it's one of the Enclave books and those like you sometimes you don't know until the second book of the series or later on in the series even entirely so that's why I've been reviewing them on BFCG even though they are it, it's a hit or miss if they actually have Christian content if they're just clean if there's an allegory element so far this really was just I would call it more of a clean, we've got a few light mentions of God, like when Claire thanks God, but that could also sound flippant to some readers, so we'll see how the second book goes. I'm, I'm, I'm nervous about that second book, I will say. Peter in this book, Peter Pan, he was such a well done character because in the original Peter Pan, I've skimmed it. He's, he's a brat, like no, we, no, I don't think anyone really likes Peter. But in this book, he has like that, okay, he's having to come to England, there's things happening in Neverland, and he's growing up because of the lack of pixie dust. And so you have a lot of that where he is ashamed of past behavior, but still is having that very confident, cocky, Peter Pan-esque vibe that he has. So it was a very interesting to see almost a war within himself about his growing up. It was interesting. It was very, very interesting. I'm still honestly like thinking about it a few days after I've read it now and it was very interesting. It was very interesting. I just, I don't know. That last chapter gave me a glimpse of what the next book, which is the final book in the duology, is going to be and I, I'm nervous. I'm very nervous. But definitely because of those darker elements and then the suicidal attempts and the abuse from a parent figure, I would put this as 17 plus personally 
because also not having the any real faith content so like they're discussing about their attempts or sharing about how they wanted to end it all and it just felt kind of off to me because there was no go back to God conversation and or not literally go back but like it rotates back to a topic about him there was none of that so I guess maybe that's why it felt odd to me I don't know I'm curious what I'll think of the second book I own this first one but I most likely will not buy the second one my library has it so I'm just gonna read it from there the next book I'm gonna be discussing is Lady of Disguise by Melanie Dickerson this is book six in the Derricotte Tales series and I gave it two stars it's really no secret on this channel that I haven't been loving this series. The first three books weren't bad, but these last three ones haven't really been my thing. And you know, the thing is with this one, it had a lot of really good potential. It is a retelling of Jack and the Beanstalk, which I'm pretty sure I've never read. Oh wait, this is a, this is a Ginger Bent retelling, isn't it? Because she's Jack. Oh, I can cross that off on the Once Upon a February readathon. Hmm, okay, I need, we'll discuss that at the end of this video because I did not get a reading vlog filmed for y'all, I'm so sorry. But we'll discuss that at the end. This is actually, though, a gender bent one because she is the Jack character. So, she lives with her aunt and uncle and her little sister and then her cousin. And the cousin's a turkey, the uncle is a horrible bean, the aunt is not the best, but her and her sister are just sticking it out, and her uncle is constantly threatening to marry her and her little sister off to old men. Because, yeah, that's just what they did, I guess. And it's a really good threat in these books. But Louisa, though, our main girl, has always been told about this giant's treasure. And she gets it in the idea in her head that if she finds that treasure, her and her sister can go live by themselves and like everything will be great, you know? Right. So she sneaks out to go find that treasure and meets our main guy who knows that she's a girl even though she's trying to disguise herself as a boy. So he got major points for that in my book that he just like, he's like, yeah, no, this is a girl. What? what hmm. Hmm. I'm going to help her. And so I liked him for that. I really did like this book for a lot of aspects in the beginning, particularly because it wasn't an insta-love attraction thing they really fell more for their personalities which is always nice to see in christian fiction because it's always physically attraction based typically i'm not gonna say always but typically typically it always is y'all know so i was very curious about how this one would be because the prior two books in the series have been that way but this book it really wasn't that way they did notice each other's physical appearance of course but it wasn't it wasn't that wasn't the thing that made them fall in love with the other like I've seen before and even in this series before. So I did like that element. I liked just that they were friends first. But the thing is with fairy tale retelling, sometimes you just have to suspend your dis your belief, your disbelief. And I had to do that a lot in this book. And particularly because Louisa wasn't the s the brightest bulb in the chandelier y'all like her uncle's threatening to marry off her 12-year-old sister and then she's going to go leave her sister with the idea that, hey, I've got two weeks before the bands have to be read, it'll be fine. That's was incredibly risky in my opinion, and I thought she was insane for that, but it's a book, so it all works out. There were little odd comments, though, that I'm not quite sure why were in there, particularly about her 12-year-old sister and, like, other little things, and then a lot of mentions about, like, them on their journey, their quest, if you will. A lot of mentions of them uh, going to the bathroom outdoors. I'm just like, why? Why is that mentioned so many times? Like that was a lot of mentions of that. And then as the book continued, Louisa continuously kind of asks God for a sign. And when a priest tells her, "Oh, you really shouldn't do that," he, she just brushes that comment off. And she did that quite a bit. Now, mind you, there is also a friar in this book that he was a judgmental lack of compassion man. So he didn't portray the Catholic Church in a good way. And then she's brushing off the priest's comment. And I kind of went into this in my final thoughts in my review. That, that just doesn't settle well with me. And I know it could be definitely like that time period and just... The main girls have read the holy scriptures for themselves, which was not common in that time period. But they've been honored, they've been privileged enough to do that. And so they know what the Bible says. And, oh, I could go into that. But, you know, if that just, like, if that right there just struck a little chord with you, uh, yeah, that's how I feel. Um, 
trying to think how I can put it condensedly because this video is going to be so long enough. But I did write down my thoughts about that and it just, it didn't settle well with me, the faith content. And then as the book continued and as their feelings for each other grew, the kissing got to be in my opinion, too much for a preteen reader. And in my opinion, most fairy tale retellings with like, you know, dust obviously is not for preteens. But when it comes to Melanie Dickerson, I feel like her books are typically like, can be aimed for preteens or just that new teen, like 13, 14 year old age. But this had too much kissing in my opinion for that age group. It was a little much, but the plot was really simple. So it's like, which, which side do you give up? The age range, but let, let them read the all the kissing or do you do the older ones but maybe they get bored by the plot it was an interesting thing I had a lot of books and you're gonna see most of them in this video this past month that I'm just having to think on and think on and when I do with my reviews or whenever I'm just having to really like chew on it to see is this is this okay for those NBFCG's target market of 9 to 19 and this book had its pros and cons, to say the least. <laughs> the next book to discuss is The Lost King's Daughter by A.D. German. This is a non-magical fantasy book set in like a medieval time period, I guess you could call it. I gave it three stars. This one, I'm having, I keep filming my, my trying to do a little summary of it, but I'm not doing very well. Basically, our main girl, I think her name is Finnick. Finnick, maybe, is how you pronounce it. There's a guide in the very back of the book. And I think that's how you say it. It totally could not be how you say it, though. So take what I say with a grain of salt. But she has been living in a village for as long as she can remember with a lady who is not related to her. But she has a gold cross pendant necklace that is broken. And she's always been told to keep it, keep it hidden. She wears it, but to keep it hidden. Don't let any of the knights or anybody see it because gold is very valuable. And when they happen to see it, they start chasing after her, but here comes this other guy who rescues her. And lots of different things happen and she basically gets put on this quest of finding out if she is the Lost King's daughter. Not the King's Lost Daughter, but the Lost King's daughter. So there's different political intrigue and claims to the thrones and you know all that kind of stuff so it was a slower read for me especially for it being 460 pages like that's that was quite a big book because of the size of the book and I don't feel like a ton happens it does feel like kind of a slower read but you can tell it's really setting up for the rest of the series it was entertaining I had a little difficulty with the writing style but I was curious what was going to happen to her and just see her personality kind of grow and come to be. I personally do prefer dialogue heavy books. I feel like I'm kind of in the minority with that. I feel like I always see people describe, say that they like like scenic books and describing all the scenery. And this is something this book did really well with describing all the scenery and where you could really picture it. And I do think that added to the page count, but it was really neat to be able to almost picture exactly what they're, at least what I think they were discussing and the different places. It was really interesting where that that was definitely a an important feature, I guess you could say, of this book was describing all the places and the views. And it was it was neat because it kind of made you feel like you were there. I don't know how to explain that, but yeah, like that. <laughs> as far as the romance, it was very light and then it kind of came out of left field a little bit to me. I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'll have to see about the second book whenever it releases about that because I'm not, I'm not sure how I feel about that guy and all that situation, but we'll see. And then Faith content wise was also light, but you could tell that the good guys of the world, of this kingdom, they did have a faith. So I assume again, the second book will have more development in that regard as well. Overall, not bad. I gave it three stars, a bit of a slower read than what I prefer, but it intrigued me. The next book in the young adult category is a contemporary book, and that is Hey Jude Carpenter by Storm Stoltz. <gasps> okay, I had really, really high hopes for this book. I talked about it in my anticipated releases video and my Once Upon a February TBR. Super high hopes for this book because it is contemporary YA. Christian contemporary YA is what got me interested in Christian fiction, so it kind of just felt like going back to my roots of 
my genre that I just adore, that I will take over any other genre, I will take contemporary Christian YA. So it was just so lovely to read a new one on the market. I really, really enjoyed this one. This is about Jude and Mona. Her actual name is Ramona, but nobody except her uncle calls her Ramona. It's just Mona. She prefers to be called Mona. And they live in a small town and his family has a dairy farm that is financially struggling and then our main girl really likes art and reading and music and all that kinds of things and they get off a little bit on the wrong foot but then then things get better and they become really good friends and Mona is determined to save his family's farm and just really does so she was such a great character she was really such a sweetheart and of course we've got just a little bit of romance in it with that romance, I mean, they are, what, how old were they, like 14, 15? Yeah, about 14. And so there was a kiss at the end that I was like, hmm. I don't know how I feel about 14 year olds kissing. Like, if they were 16, oh, the, five stars probably. Like, that was great. This, let them with uh, 14, that felt a little young in that regard. Like, I, I know it happens, but it was a little much. But the epilogue! Oh, the epilogue, the epilogue, the epilogue. Oh, that that has to be one of the best epilogues I've ever read. I loved that epilogue. That was the cutest epilogue. That was so sweet. My cheeks hurt. Okay, what, what else can I say about this book besides fangirling? I guess just like, number one, I liked this book just because they were great characters. I liked it because it was my precious contemporary YA themed book. It just It's one of those books you ought to read in the summer when it's hot and you can hear the cicadas crying, screaming, whatever word you use for them. That kind of like, it just had that and just like a, a glass of cold iced tea or just, it had such a summer vibe and contemporary Christian YA books with a summer vibe? <gasps> Sign me up. Like that is completely, if I had to pick a book aesthetic I love, it would be that one. And I do blame like the Christy Miller series, Krista McGee's series, uh, Amy Clipston's contemporary YA series. Those were the books I adored, absolutely adored as a new Christian fiction reader. That was what got me into the genre. I adore the Christy Miller series. Did I say the Christy Miller series? I think I said that. But like though, this had those vibes and I just loved that little detail. And it also is featuring a church that split apart when our main characters were young. And so there was kind of a fallout in the community because of that and a rivalry, if you will. And it was just really nice to see that handled well. And their pastors were very involved in the community and then talking to our main characters. It was just really neat to see that. Oh, what else can I say? I just, I really, really enjoyed this book. The whole setting and the characters and everyone's likes and dislikes and just all that kind of thing, just, they just felt so realistic. And like the, these were real people. If you told me this was based off of a real life event and families and characters and people and all that kind of stuff, I think I'd believe you. It just felt so realistic in that regard. I think I would mark it though for maybe f ages 15 plus just because of a couple offhanded comments and then that kiss, even though the main characters are 14. I would, I would still say probably 15 and up personally, but it was just so much fun. There was a humor in it. There was family content. And I really love seeing healthy family dynamics and just like family dynamics where the parents are in the picture and they're not terrible because that is a thing or dead, you know, terrible or dead. And that's, that really wasn't the thing. They had to they're at that 14 year old age so they really like Jude and his mom had a bit of a strained relationship but they have to work things out and it was ah it was just good it was just really good really I savored this book as I read it I really enjoyed it I definitely plan to get a copy for my bookshelves the next book I read would be in the contemporary romance category and that would be first in my heart by Rachel Blanchard I think is maybe how you pronounce the author's last name this was a really sweet romance novella it did feel a little fast paced at times, but I think that's due to the page length. It was overall really sweet. So the premise of this book is about our main girl and her name is Ava and she has just moved a thousand miles away from everything she's known to potentially have a teaching job near her best friend. And everyone is really welcoming in the community to her except Pete and Pete is a teacher and he is tired of people setting him up. I can't blame him. He's kind of a grump. So we kind of do have that sunshine grumpy trope. Trope. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Trope. And it was very interestingly done. I thought, honestly, 
the romance felt pretty healthy. The main girl, Ava, did start falling for the wrong guy, and I did get a little frustrated with her because it's like, can't you see the, maybe not bright red, but maybe orange toned flags that guy was giving? But eventually, things work out, and it was really cute because we see Pete, the main guy, start falling first, but it was really just because he was noticing her personality and how kind she was to everyone, and I love it. I love it when we fall for personality over appearance, especially in romance books, because that just, I don't feel like I see that that often, so I love it when that happens, and I just thought that was so sweet that they, she didn't really care for him because of his first impression and different things, but he's like, he was a little bit of a grump, and then he starts noticing her personality and how kind she is, and started falling for her, so that's always, that's always cute. One thing I think this book really highlighted was their strengths and weaknesses and how they really balanced out the other, which did cause them to butt heads a few times, not gonna lie, but that led into communication and discussions, which is good to see because we're not assuming what the other thinks, we are discussing it, and that is, again, another really good thing to see in a Christian romance book. I think if you like romance books that are clean, obviously, clean, that's all I want to talk about on this channel is clean books, and if they aren't clean, I'm going to let you know, but this one was definitely clean, and also my standard of clean, because we've discussed I have a different standard for that. If you like the books where it's more awkward with them falling in love, like it's not all of like the emotions and the physical attraction, or just, oh my goodness, we're in love, mooning over the other. If you like, if you, if you don't care for those and you really like the ones where it's kind of awkward and it really gives you like that awkward butterfly feeling and just, it's just awkward, you know, when you start to fall for someone and it's just kind of like, how do, how do I react around this person? What do I do? It definitely had that vibe, which I really liked. I thought that was really sweet. I think the author did that really well. There was good faith content, there was discussions, there was a couple moments that were a little cringy, but again, I feel like most romance books have that, so it's okay. Overall, I enjoyed it. I gave it, I think, a four-star rating. It was really cute. I will admit, I'm not a fan of the cover. I feel like it needs to stand out a little bit more. From a distance, it's, it's not the best, but the inside is what matters, and the inside was pretty cute. The next category would be suspense, and I have my first one star of the year, y'all. <laughs> Tracking a Killer by Elizabeth Goddard. Okay, so let's all take a guess as to why I picked up this book. This would have been a great moment for Daisy to bark in the background, but she's actually sleeping. Obviously, I read it for the beagle on the cover. I was here for the beagle and I was here for the beagle only. Let's just put it that way. I'm trying to think of how to nicely describe this book besides ridiculous. Uh, okay, let's see. Our main girl is Harlow, which I do want to point out. I love that name. I've seen that name before. I think it's a very pretty name. Do I judge book characters by their name? No, but if they have a nice name, it doesn't hurt, right? So Harlow has is a canine officer, and with her beagle nail, they are able to find bodies and remains of bodies. So they have been called to come help on the serial killer case. And what did you know? When did you know? We have a, uh, I think, I think they were old flames. I actually wasn't going to say that. I feel like, yes, they were, they knew each other prior. And yeah, they had a blow up. That's right. That's what happened. But I was going to say, when did you know that the serial killers, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? His victims, his, uh, I won't say ideal type because that's not the word. What is it? Victim profile, that's the word. Victim profile matches her, wouldn't you know? And she's not gonna just like, you know, walk away, let them call someone else in. She's gotta prove herself at the sake of her own safety. And she sticks around and of course things happen and it's up to the main guy who's an FBI agent who's on the case and they of course know each other. They used to date, it's the second chance romance in that regard, so. He's like, oh, well, obviously then I have to protect you if you're not going to leave kind of thing. So things happen. She was ridiculous. She was ridiculous. She acted like a teenager at times. We're trying to be told, oh, I'm a, she's a professional. I can do this. Da, 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 da. Can you really? Can you? I beg to differ. Like if I was her supervisor, I would have pulled her ASAP. But I wasn't her supervisor, so there's that. I would say this book was about 70% on their romance, which I typically expect that with love-inspired suspense books. 
they typically do expect a higher romance content in these books. It's just, there were so many things that I was just like, this is, this is getting ridiculous. Like, she complains that something's not fair to God. And then she keeps describing his muscles as ropey. When I, oh, y'all, I rolled my eyes so hard. It's impressed they didn't, impressive they didn't get stuck because, oh. Okay. Faith content wise, there really wasn't a ton besides like, Lord, please keep this person safe. Lord, please do this. Lord, this isn't fair. That kind of thing. And I don't even know if they said Lord. They might have just said God. But there was that element and then their very obvious attraction for each other. We also get teased a lot about their history and their backstory and we're being given pieces. And that just really annoys me when we are just like given a little breadcrumb here and there. I, I don't like that in books, and that's probably why I dislike the second chance ro relationship trope so much is because of that teasing. Like, just just give it to me. I don't care if it's called information dumping. Just give it to me. Quit quit giving me a little tease here, tease there, tease there. It, mm, I don't like it. Also, I, know, just, I gotta just point this out so y'all can realize how um, silly, silly, ridiculous is the word I'd like to use one part of their little like teasing was is that she knew the exact number of days since their blow up happened. Eight years, five months, ten days. She knew. She knew. Okay. Okay. This was such a miss and I'm so sad about it because look at this cute little beagle. Nell, literally Nell the beagle was only there to like sniff a couple times go into her kennel in the car, her crate in the car, and to be lit out to go to the bathroom. We didn't see Nell much elsewise, and I was afraid of that. I was afraid of that. I have a few more of these Beagle canine books on my TBR, but they gotta be better, right? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> The next book in the suspense category was Fatal Witness by Patricia Bradley. This is book two in the Pearl River series. I gave this one three stars. I liked it. The first book was, oh, I can't think of the title. I'm going to put the cover here. I talked about it last year, so I'll link my recent reads up there as well if you'd like to hear my thoughts on that one. I didn't really care for that one, though, because it had to do with internet crimes and had a lot about blackmail and just a lot of different elements of that that was just sad and depressing and awful and just also creepy like very creepy like I obviously read books about serial killers and I definitely don't read them to relax because that ain't helping my paranoia at all but that is a creep level but the internet crime and like that kind of thing and people watching through other people's cameras on their phones or laptops or that kind of thing and like being blackmailed that kind of thing is creepy to me and so that book was honestly a miss because of that but I did want to try this author again because that was my first book by her so I picked up the second book in the series and this is following Danny, who she is a potter which those parts were really cool. I really liked those elements because I've always wanted to get one of those pottery wheels. Like, that's, like, on my list of useless items. Not useless, but, like, items I don't need but I, I want for some reason. There's That's a long list, actually, of w some weird items. But that is one that I'm just like, that would be the coolest thing to have. So I did really like those elements. I actually forgot this was a suspense book for the first bit of the book because the first chapter is happening about a young girl witnessing her parents' murder. And it wasn't, it wasn't, I've seen it described stronger or more details in that kind of content. This one wasn't much in that regard. And then we pick up 25 years later with our main girl, Danny, and she doesn't remember anything from her childhood besides what happened after the page of the age of nine when she was living with her uncle and then her aunt and he is very protective of her and he, she's not sure why and all that kind of thing. Now meanwhile there is a grandmother figure in North Carolina trying to figure out what happened to her granddaughter when her daughter and son-in-law were murdered. Her granddaughter disappeared and has never been found. So she's trying to figure things out. And now there's little clues in an, a magazine article that gives her the idea that Danny may be her long-lost granddaughter. So she enlists the, what is he? Oh yes, he was a canine officer as well. The canine officer of her town to try to figure out is this actually her granddaughter. And honestly, just that first bit minus that first chapter with the flashback or 
the recapping of history, if you will. I honestly was like, oh, this is just about a grandmother trying to find her lost lost daughter, and then we've got a little bit of romance. I was like, oh, this is cute. And then the suspense entered, and I went, oh, yeah, this is a suspense book. I totally forgot about that, weirdly enough. But it wasn't bad. Overall, I was invested into this book. I was very curious about what was going to happen. One other random note I think was really cool was that the main girl has the dog breed a pulley, which is basically the smaller version of the mop dog. I don't know why, but I loved that little detail. I don't think I've ever read about that dog in a fiction book, and it was just so funny to see everyone's reactions and comments. And it was kind of, you know, the same thing as like, is that a mop or a dog, that kind of thing? But I don't know why, I just thought that was very entertaining. So I really liked that aspect. I liked the pottery aspect. I did really get distracted by that found family amnesia trope, because I do like the amnesia trope. It was a little strange, in my opinion, to have the main girl from the first book, Alex, to have her point of view in this. I'm not really sure why, because I don't feel, suspense-wise, I don't feel like that added anything. It was just like we were getting a continuation of her romance that added to this page length, for sure. This is 380 pages, and I don't think it needed to be that long. But I didn't really care for Alex in the first book. Like, she was fine, but I didn't really, like, I didn't really, really like her or anything. So maybe that's more of my opinion, but I did think it was an interesting choice to have her perspective in this book as well. That was interesting. I'm curious if the third book in the series will have somebody else's point of view. Like, will it have Dandy's point of view? Will it have Alex's point of view again? I don't... I don't know. I thought that was interesting. If I could just nitpick one tiny thing in this book, it would be that all the chapters ended really abruptly, which feels like a really odd thing to note, but nearly every chapter ended abruptly because they were doing a switch to someone else's point of view instead of having like you know the break of a middle of a chapter every chapter ended very abruptly and I don't recall that in the first book but I was very like oh my word this horror online game is terrible I was very creeped out so I don't know if I really would have noticed that little detail because this kind of felt more of a calm suspense book like it still was suspenseful at times but it didn't really get my blood pumping too much. They obviously got shot at and ran off the road. And you know, all the classic suspense elements. But it never... It never got my heart pumping too much. Like we would with like a serial killer book. But which I liked about that because it made it feel calmer. But then we also had Alex's parts that were much chiller, if you will. So, I don't know. I, I kind of have mixed feelings on this book. I gave it three stars. I say mixed feelings, it's really not mixed feelings. I liked elements, I didn't like elements. So that would be my little thing I would like to nitpick, is that the chapters just ended very abruptly. And that also, the, the very end of the book also ended pretty abruptly, so I was like, oh, that's, that's kind of a bummer, because you had all these pages, and I feel like it could have been maybe a little more flowy, instead of dash, 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 if that made any sense. I have a lot of thoughts on this book that I put in my full content review and I'm trying to, you know, just give y'all the summary of it, but I can't really say this book and another book I'll be discussing here in a minute both had something that I'm starting to see more in Christian fiction that I'm really not liking, but I can't tell you what that is. Because that would be a spoiler to who the villain was in this book, but I'm not, I'm not happy with who the villain was in this book. I had an inkling, I was pretty positive, and it was right, and I just, I wasn't happy with who that was, and I can't tell you, I can't tell you why. As far as the romance, I felt like she was much more attracted to him than he was of her, but he actually really stayed, I'm going to say in character, which is funny because he is a character, but in the sense of his law enforcement, he is here to protect her. He can't be falling for her because that's going to cause judgment flaws and all that kind of thing, which was really nice to see that happen because, you know, we constantly, I don't, oh yeah, I don't know, do you read suspense books? If you read suspense books, maybe you can agree with me that it's a very common trope to have the girl in need of protector, protector, bodyguard, male lead, and maybe not really bodyguard, but some kind of law enforcement officer that's going to protect her, and then they fall for each other and they're going to kiss over a dead body. You know, that's just how it works. This book didn't have that part. I don't think it had that part. I think I'd remember if it had that part. But it still, it happens often. You know, where they just kind of fall for each other and he makes a bad judgment call. And this guy was like, oh, 
I like her, but I, I can't, no, I'm not going to focus on that. So I think that's why I didn't really feel like he liked her as much as she liked him, because she kind of fell for him pretty quick. But he was very much focused on her safety. And I just really appreciated that, because it's like, wow, a male lead can't do that. You can't focus on keeping her safe, and then later kissing her or having a relationship with her. Who knew? Who knew? He knew. Overall thoughts, not bad. Probably better for older girls, though because of the law enforcement side of it. The who the villain was, though, did affect my rating over, and it just overall thoughts, which was disappointing. For the historical side, okay, here we go. I, I have two that I, um... Okay, first book is The Lost Lieutenant by Erica Vitch. I recently finished this one, and in all honesty, this is one of those books. I think, out of this list of 14 books, I've had to just, like, stew and chew on, let's see, Dust, Lady of Disguise, Tracking a Killer, I didn't, I didn't stew on that one much because I don't want to, Fatal Witness, I, uh, not really Fatal Witness, I didn't really have to do that one, Lost Lieutenant, the next book, so I had about four books I really had to really, really think on and just go, Just had to think about it, you know, like I don't know really how to put into words that I really had to think about some of these books and the ratings and what I thought about them. And so in this case, man, okay, let's see. Let me give you the description first and then we're going to discuss kind of what I thought about it. This is a Regency book and our main guy is Evan and he saves the life of an important person's godson in a war. And so when he comes to in the hospital after his injuries, he is basically given a title and he is now an earl. So he went from a commoner that was a soldier that just wants to go back to fighting and be with his unit to an earl and having to do society and all that kind of stuff. And I really liked that element. I liked that element. I liked a lot of elements of this, but then there was other things. Our main girl though, oh, what was her name? Her name ain't even on here. Diana was her name. It's not even on here. Wow, that's weird. It's all about him. That's different. So Diana is the sister of the guy he saved. Now, Diana's father is an absolutely despicable, horrible human being. Her brother is not much better. He just really isn't. So she is basically being sold off by her father so he can get her hands on the inheritance that her grandmother left her. And so he's just like, okay, I'm just going to sell her off and then we, I get the money. So that's basically his premise. He's a horrible, abusive, verbally, physically. He's a terrible human being. Her brother is horrible and one of her brother's friends is also horrible. Like there were three guys in this book that could have been like tarred, feathered, and thrown to the sharks. Case closed right there. And so we have a marriage of convenience that happens between Diana and Evan. And Evan's a good guy. He's a good guy. He really was a pretty good guy, but because of his time in the battles and the war, he is missing parts of his memory and has signs of PTSD and anxiety and panic attacks even, where he just can't remember what happened then. And so we see a lot of elements of that, and I feel like the author wrote that very well. I do really like this author's writing style because she always includes such, I don't want to say random because that makes it sound haphazard, but just different Regency elements. This is the author that wrote the Thorndike and Swans Regency mystery series, which I really, really enjoyed. And this series came before that series. They're connecting because of characters. So I've been wanting to read this series forever, but it was a marriage of convenience. All three books in this series are a marriage of convenience. And that is easily my least favorite trope. It really is. So with that, that typically adds in more sexual content and mentions of intimacy and all of that kind of element. And I will say, like, if you've read Short Straw Bride by Karen Widemeyer, that book went completely past my limits. Like, I was not a fan of how things were handled in that book. This book was went right up to the line for me. And then kind of went a little over it. Just like a little tiptoe over it, personally. So if you're fine with the content in that one, you probably would be fine with the content in this one. It's not, I don't recommend either of these books, though for those in the BFCG target market. So like put it as over 20 in my opinion, but even as me over 20, I don't care for knowing about their bedroom 
interests and activities. I don't want to know. I just like I do. I don't. I think you know. No, thank you. <laughs> I don't. I don't need to know that information. It's that's personal, private information. I don't need to know. And I do feel like the author handled it more on the delicately side than I've seen a lot of other Christian fiction books do it. But it's still like I wouldn't recommend it for teenagers at all because it's still there and it's it gives you a lot of those emotions and butterflies and that kind of thing and I don't think that's needed to stir up at a young age so it had those elements but this okay so here's the thing when I read books for BFCG to do content reviews to type up all the content and I know some people think I go over the top. I'm just going to tell you what's in it and you make the decision for yourself of what bothers you. That's always been how BFCG works. So with, with a lot of books I review, I read probably 9 out of 10 books I read as Kindle books because I can just highlight the content and it makes it really easy. And so I will re-basically read the book once I'm done with it to grab all my highlights. I will go back through it and type up the content after I have finished the book. It has made it a much simpler process for my reviewing layout, if you will. And so I basically, you could say I, I read a book once fully, and then I, you could honestly say I skim the entire book again. And as a good rule of thumb, when a book is about 300 pages, I typically have a little over 300 highlights. Like it typically works out where there's a highlight per page or more. Fantasy books always go higher because fantasy books with all the magic content and elements and all that kind of thing. But this book was 277 pages and I had 525 highlights. Now mind you, probably about 50 of those were ones of just like humor or something I liked that I just thought was funny, so I highlighted those as well. But when it enters into that kind of plot line of the Marriage of Convenience and we've got like the noticing and all that kind of things. I feel like I need to do like a more in-depth video explaining how I do my reviews. I feel like I've been asked that before. If that would interest y'all, please let me know. But like that's the very general summary. And so at first I was like, okay, I think this is a two-star book for me. But then once I... Once I continued to go through all my highlights and pull things, I feel like it's lower and that's really sad to me because I had such high hopes and like plot wise I did like a lot of elements of it but the thing is there is a jerk a terrible gross guy who is after our main girl and very obsessed with her and just wanting to have his way with her and so we see a lot of that and then her father is just horrible her brother is terrible there's so many things but then with the Faith content was just, I don't, mm. I don't, it just, mm. both Diana and Evan, because of past things, have almost negative comments about God, so like Evan at one point says that getting the Earl title and having to marry Diana and everything just felt like a, an awful joke from God, and of course that hurt her, because hello? And he was just talking out loud. And then she makes different comments on if she doesn't know if it's, if it's, uh, if there's any point to praying, basically. I can't think of the exact phrase, so I'm paraphrasing there. But basically, do her prayers even reach God? Because her circumstances have never changed. She's prayed to get out of the abusive household. And it's never been answered in the way she wants. And there was a lot of those things. But then once they fell in love, it was like everything worked out. Like, oh, yeah. Sure, everything's fine because we fell in love. And I don't know if I'm explaining that well enough. because It felt more like almost that savior trope, which I've discussed before, that is very common in Christian fiction. And I just dislike it so much. I just Our only savior is Jesus Christ, and that is if you are male or female. It ain't going to be another sinful human being that is going to disappoint you. I've discussed this before, I'm pretty positive on this channel, that I really dislike seeing that, and he definitely kind of became that for her. And there was one point, and I just, I have to do the quote from this, because she really struggled with, like, God answering her prayers, and how, basically answering them how she wanted. Like, I liked both of them, don't get me wrong, I liked both of them, but then they had their moments, I just kind of wanted to whack them, because it's like, no, 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 that's not quite how that works. Especially with the faith content side of it. 
she really wanted proof of him ans of God him answering her prayers and it was it was through Evan that she really felt where was my quote on that Oh, the proof that God was answering her prayers was being loved by Evan. And now, mind you, she's thinking this as they're kissing. But that that's... that No. No. That's, that's, not, no, that's not how that works. So, like, honestly, I wanted to give them both, like, okay, we need to get right with God before we start... Like, they obviously had to be forced to get married because of circumstances and situations. It is the marriage of convenience trope. But it's like, hang on here. Hold on to the desires here, people. We need to be talking to the Lord. We need to be praying sincerely. We need to be in our Bibles. Like, hold hold the desire. Oh, put them in separate ends of the house or something because... No. No. I don't feel like I'm doing very well explaining my thoughts on this. And I feel like I'm just rambling, so I apologize. I think the only other way I could maybe describe it would be that it felt like they got, when once they fell in love and like everything was hunky-dory right there at the end, that they felt like God answered their prayers or their disappointment in life not going how the way they wanted through the other main character. Not through having a relationship with the Lord, but through this other human being that they are currently kissing. And I just don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. So that was so... That was so disappointing. Like at first I was like, okay, I'm really enjoying this. And then we start entering in with the intimacy kind of hints and mentions. And I was like, oh, not loving that. I don't like that. So, okay, maybe a two star personally, but I still wouldn't recommend it for those ages 9 to 19. But then as I'm rereading, I'm like, this faith content feels off. Why does this feel off to me? And it just didn't settle well. And I, I had quite a few books. Again, I had, think there's four books in this video I'm going to dis discuss that just there was something on it that I'm just like there's there's something something in my spirit is giving me a little alert if you will that something's off here why is it off and I really have had to as I've been saying chew on these books and like figure out and spend a good full day thinking about why is this off to me what what is this holy spirit alert I'm getting here and for me on this book it was the faith content it was Something was just off. And it was the fact that they were putting the other on a pedestal when they were getting along. Because they definitely had their moments where they didn't talk to each other because of secrets and whatnot. But I just, I don't agree with that mindset. How else can I explain it? I'm not sure how else I can say it. It definitely gave off the, oh, everything worked out. We're good with God because we're in love. And I just don't agree with that message. And I see it pretty often in Christian fiction, but this book definitely had that. And I know, like, they couldn't help their circumstances of having to get married because of somebody else's, like, hey, you need to get married. And he's the, what was it, pr prince, or, well, the prince guy of the time period of this time period. I don't remember what he is. But, and you don't say no to him. And that was very much a very clear thing throughout this book that you don't say no to him. So it's like, oh, he wants to get married? Okay, we're getting married, kind of thing. And so they definitely had to make the best of their situations, and I'm glad they fell in love. But I wish we would have had that faith content and that relationship with God be more important than the relationship with the other human. <sighs> yeah, okay, hopefully I did okay describing that. I feel kind of all over the place about this book. It's such a mix, I really do have mixed feelings because I liked a lot of the plot elements. But then we add in the marital parts and then the horrible people. Oh my goodness, the horrible people. Her father was terrible. Her father was terrible. Her brother was just, uh, I would push him off a dock in a heartbeat. And then the other guy who was following her around was just a disgusting creep. And then we have the faith content that I don't feel okay with. And I, yeah, that was so disappointing. I'm gonna try the next two books in that trilogy. Book two is about Marcus, which I have really liked Marcus. He, I liked him in this book. I liked him in the Thorndike and Regency, uh, Th Thorndike and Swan Regency mystery series. I really want to read this trilogy just because of his book, but I do know that has to do more with prostitution and that kind of thing, so we'll see. <laughs> the bar is way lower though now, unfortunately. I just don't do Marriage of Convenience as it is, and then 
then there was more to that book that was just like, wow, mm -hmm, disappointing. So, moving on. The Irish Matchmaker by Jennifer DiBill. I also gave two stars. <laughs> This was not, this is not a very, this video is like, we started off eh, and then we got in high, and then we're like, bunk, 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 as we go down. But we're gonna end this video on a high note, I promise. So, the matchmaker, the Irish matchmaker. Okay, this is set in 1905, and our main girl, I don't know, Caddy? I'm just gonna call her by her nickname, and I think that's how we say it, C-A-T-Y? She is the daughter of a matchmaker, she is a matchmaker in her own right, and she has this client that her father has given to her about our main guy, and I think it's Donald? Donald? These Irish names, I'm, I am not familiar with any Irish history or phrases or anything like that, so I, that took me a bit to figure out what everything was referring to and whatnot. But he is a widow with a young daughter, and his young daughter really wants a mom and for him to get married. So he signs up with the matchmaker and it's up to our main girl to find his match. You know where this is going. So unfortunately, you may not realize is that she is falling for the wrong guy. And we see elements that this guy is a red flag. Hello? Like, yeah. is she colorblind? Like what's happening here? And so we know this guy is a creep. We don't want her to marry him. We know this as a reader. Obviously, because also we're not getting his point of view. If we don't get your point of view, you ain't the love interest. Like this bottom line right there. So I have mixed feelings on this book. It started out really cute. It was really cute. I really liked his daughter. And then we started getting really um, noticing of the other's physical appearance and his muscles. Oh my word, his muscles. Oh. And then it started getting really kissing. So I was just like, hmm. Hmm. It just it went past what I would recommend for... BFCG's target age. If you're really interested in Irish history, then you might enjoy it, but definitely older, older teens. I personally would put this as a higher age. I like matchmaking books, so even though based off of the back cover and seeing that she's going to be falling for the wrong guy, I was still curious about it because of the matchmaker elements, and I did like that. She did make bad choices, particularly about falling in love with this wrong guy, or just fall being infatuated with the wrong guy. There was just, there was things like, okay, so we've got quite a bit of kissing, and I was like, oh my, oh my! <laughs> a little too much, in my, a little too much kissing, in my opinion, the physical attraction thing. One personal thing, and I know it, this is part of history, one personal thing I don't like seeing in books, historical, contemporary, I don't care what genre, I don't like seeing the main characters drink and it being perceived as okay. I have incredibly, incredibly strong feelings on alcohol and drinking. I'm avoiding my soapbox right now, but basically, I don't like it, okay? I know that's very, like, culturally accurate probably for Ireland, especially at this time, but at one point, the main guy drinks and then is, uh, it's noted that his chest filled with courage to tell the truth to someone. I don't like that message. I don't like that message at all. This book also did have more of the Catholic faith elements, which makes sense historically, but it was more of a, they both were kind of upset with God, but then by the end you get the opinion that they're good with God, if you will, but we don't really see that much. We don't really, if we're gonna have negative comments from a character about God and not believing, or do prayers really work, and I feel the same way with The Lost Lieutenant, I feel this way with any book like this, if we're gonna see that, I want to see a, a uh, wake-up moment. I want to see that on page for the characters. I don't want to just get the impression at the end of the book that they're good with God. I read Christian fiction to be inspired. I don't read... If I wanted just like a, a fluff read, I'll, re I'll read cr clean fiction. I read Christian fiction to have that faith content. So to have like ne almost negative ish negative leaning not positive strong faith content at the beginning of a book if it's more of that negative weak the word that's coming to mind is spindly but I don't think that's a really a, a word for that but that implies the picture I'm thinking of just a lack of faith if we have that and we've got their negative comments for however much of the book I want to see I want to see that character's perspective change on page because I already had their negative comments on page. If we're going to have character development in that regard, it ought to be on page. And this book was lacking that, in my opinion. So yeah, there was that. 
my little soapbox rant for two different things. So it is what it is. Uh, overall, it could have been really cute. It did have its cute moments, but there was a lot of kissing, a lot of noticing, including his muscles, and then just a really jerk of a character that just brought down the ratings, and I would not recommend it for ages eight, uh, 9 to 19, but, you know, the older age, obviously, more so. Would not recommend. Okay, this is our last one for Christian fiction, and then we have clean fiction. This, vi this video will pick up at some point, I promise. The Secrets Beneath by Kimberly Woodhouse, I gave three stars, and I'm still honestly thinking about three stars? Is that? I feel like it's more probably of a two and a half. I'm going to first give out the trigger warnings for this book that for those sensitive to murders, including of a young girl, physical and verbal abuse from a parent, and then, then a person with a mental illness causing harm to others, very prominent topics in this book. This is a historical book, gorgeous cover, really kind of gives you just a, um, it's going to be an easy read, kind of chill, easy, calm, wrong. And that's because we see the point of view of someone who, I don't know if the proper word is mentally unstable or if that's incorrect to say, if that's wrong to say, if it is, I apologize. We see his perspective and because of his father's abuse adds in a major heaviness to this book, in my opinion at least. Our main girl though is Anna and she works with her father who is a, oh gosh, I'm gonna say this wrong. Basically, he does dinosaur bones. We're just gonna say that. I can't say this word. This word, that word, yeah, it ends with ologist. Got that much. And so she does all the drawings and everything, but when her dad gets sick, she has to take over the current site and manage it. And then here comes her old flame, who is Joshua, and he left his hometown and is becoming a doctor, but he is coming back. For, I don't remember why he was coming back to the hometown, but anyway, he was coming back, and oh, look, sparks are still flying. So they were pretty cute together. They had their moments that I was like, oh, this is pretty cute. But then we see this other guy's point of view, and... This is one of those books, that, like I've been discussing, that I really had to think on. I was expecting this to be a much lighter read than what it was, but because of this character and his past abuse and then things he did... Oh, I'm trying to be vague here. Her really good friend, which was actually our main guy's younger sister, they all grew up together, but her friend mysteriously disappeared when they were young. and. This friend of hers was really nice to this other guy, Julian, who has a mental illness. And she, our main girl, Anna, really started reaching out to Julian, this neighbor man, because of her friend. And I feel like that it should have been more God-led and God-inspired to be nice to him because by her doing that, it caused major problems, like major problems, major problems. I'm trying to be really vague. Um, if you are sensitive to any of those triggers though, I would just, I would avoid it. I would just avoid it. I don't know what else to tell y'all about this book. I want to give y'all so much more info about this book, but I can't because of spoilers. I can't because of spoilers. So three stars, I think. Honestly, it might be more of a two and a half for me personally. The main couple were was cute, and in their moments, like, they definitely had their issues they needed to work on, but they would talk, and things got better, and they were really cute. But because of the added element of just heaviness, I, I didn't enjoy it as much as I was hoping. So, that's an unfortunate... That's unfortunate. I will probably pick up the second book in the series, but if they seem to continue this, this thread, this theme, I, I won't be continuing. So, we'll see. Okay, my friends, we have four books left, and they are all clean fiction. I'm a little... I feel a little heavy and worn out right now. And I think it's just because I've been talking about all these different books. So hopefully I can pick my personality back up off the floor. Hmm, <laughs> we'll see. So, the first book for kind of clean fairy tale with the Once Upon a February readathon happening in February. I read different ones and uh, three of them were clean fiction. So the first one was A Goose Girl by K.M. Shia. 
I have heard so much about this author and I'm reading a book I don't think I've really seen many of my book friends talk about. I gave this one three stars. It's obviously a retelling of The Goose Girl and it wasn't bad. I don't really have too much to say on it. I, honestly, fairy tale retellings like this that are on Kindle Unlimited, I just read as either like a palate cleanser or just I want something quick that's like will only take me an hour to read, like that kind of thing. And that was definitely this. It was fine. It wasn't excellent, but it was fine. It's a ghost girl retelling. The princess was absolutely the audacity of that princess really is what I'd like to say. And then we've got our main girl who's got to fill in her role. So yeah, that's all I gotta say. It wasn't bad. I don't really know what to say. The love story for her kind of like came out of complete love field, but it is a small book so there's that. I don't really have much to say nor thoughts about this book. So next. The Steadfast Heart by Arlem Hawks. I gave three and a half four stars. This was really cute. This was, I really did like this one. This was a clean Regency romance that had very minor innuendos for that time period and then there was no language. This is a retelling of the Steadfast Ten Soldier. Can't say that word. And I've never heard of that one before for good reason because oh my goodness it is sad. Like what is wrong with the Hans Christian Andersen and the Grimm's brother? Like what happened to them? Why are all their books just so like trauma filled? Like y'all okay? <laughs> y'all need Jesus. That's all I'm gonna say. Y'all need Jesus. So it was interesting to see that and the similarities. I enjoy a good Regency book. We all know this. So I was very curious about this whole fairy tale retellings in a Regency time period. I'm definitely gonna be checking out. The majority of the rest of the series, some interest me more than others, but this one is a random book in the series. They aren't connected from my understanding, but it was really, it was really cute. The main guy, his name is Robert. He lost his foot in a battle and has now had to come back to society and he's just not happy with life, right? And then here comes our main girl, Holly, who is the, what's, what's the, the Bella the Ball, but in the Regency time period, not in the Southern style, she, but she's like, you know, kind of the it girl, if you will, of the Regency time period. But then when a scandal breaks out and she's having to get shoved, not shoved, banished, banished, that sounds dramatic, but basically she has to go live with her, her step aunt, I, aunt, half, her brother, there, there's a connection somehow. She's got to go live with this aunt that she doesn't really know in the countryside and wouldn't you know, our main guy, that's his stepmother. So he's there too. So we do have a bit of that forced proximity trope, but it didn't really, it wasn't that heavy. It felt more awkward leaning than sexual tension field leaning, which I appreciated. I don't know y'all. It was just a really sweet book, really cute. I liked a lot of elements of it. There were some parts I was like, I didn't care for, but you know, that's basically everything. There's just a couple little things that I was just like, hmm. We did have that third act problem, not really break up with that third act problem that entered in, that I was just like, oh, really this, not this. But things worked out. The ending did feel a tiny bit rushed, but it is a novella. So what do you expect? It's gonna be a little rushed. This author, I read another book by her, which was Georgiana's Secret, and I talked about that in my last recent reads. And I've just decided, even though I don't do boats or navy or ship stuff at all, I think I'm gonna be watching for her books now because her these two Regency books I read I really liked. Overall, I thought they were quite well done. So I'm going to be keeping my eye out for her other books because I enjoyed both of them. We'll see. The next book, which is the last book in this clean fairy tale retelling category, would be A Lonely Dance by Selena R. Gonzalez. I gave this one kind of three and a half, four stars as well. With clean fiction, I don't make myself pick a rating. Christian fiction, I pick a rating and I stick with it, typically, unless I think about it more. But for clean fiction, I, I allow myself a little leeway that's like, eh, 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 on the cusp, I don't know. So this book was a buddy read with the lovely Sarah over at Sarah's Tangled Tales and Celestria. This is the second book in the series that A Thieving Curse is in, and I discussed that at the end of last year. And that book really took me by surprise by how much I enjoyed it. This book, though... <laughs> So in A Thieving Curse was a Beauty and the Beast retelling, but he was a dragon. And so the villain's son, who was a villain in his own right, is Tristan. This is his story. 
that wasn't, I didn't like Tristan at all. You know, he was a good villain in that book, right? Like, he was terrible. I, I didn't like him at all. So I was like, I don't know about reading about his redemption. But Sarah's like, Lindsay, you gotta read it. And mainly she was telling me that because I wanted to skip the second book and I wanted to go to the third book. And I can't do that, apparently. Rats. So I read this one with them. It was a, a very enjoyable read because I read it with them. Ah, uh, let's see. Tristan's... I'm still not going to say I like him, but I liked how the author wrote him in this book because we truly see how a, much of a complex character he is. And it was all really because of his father's, his father was terrible. We had a theme of terrible fathers. Okay, well not a theme, well, it was only in two books, but still, that's too, too many in my opinion in this video. Ugh. But his father really did a number on him growing up, to say the least. So his his self-worth, his thoughts, his opinions, everything has been altered based on what his father has done to him over the years. We really see how complex he was in this book and how he was just trying to figure out who he was, what he could do, but then also still having those moments of going back to how he was. And I don't know if I'm making any bit of sense here, but there, basically every sentence in his point of view, uh, I was like, okay, I see where you're coming from. And then I wanted to punch his lights out. Like, it went back and forth a lot. I really was interested in this book, though, mainly because the actual retelling of this book is The Twelve Dancing Princesses, which is one of my favorite ones. I thought it was really interesting. And this one, I, I didn't actually love that element of this book, mainly because it almost felt like a... Groundhog Day plot, if you will, in the sense of the main girl has been cursed by this sorcerer guy, so we think, to basically spend the whole night dancing with him. And so we see that a lot, and she doesn't remember any of it. But we do, because we just read it, and this is like 400 plus pages. So we see a lot of that, and I was starting to get a little bored about it. But then once Tristan gets involved, and the plot picks up, and it was very interesting, I thought... This author's writing style I just really like. I really like her writing style. I get very sucked into the plot eventually. I didn't get as sucked into this book as I did the first book, but I did really like it. You know one thing I'm going to point out, and this is going to be, this kind of stood out to me more because The Lost Lieutenant, I really noticed how he was a savior for her, but in this one, even though our main girl in this one, I think it's Alira, Alira maybe is how you pronounce her name, I-L-A-R-A, -A. she was not the savior for our main guy. She was an encourager and saw more in him than he did of himself, but she wasn't his savior. And I really, truly appreciate that because I'm tired of seeing that trope. Also, when they fell in love, it didn't magically fix them. He still had to work on a lot of things and it, you could tell it's going to continue to be work for him to undo what his father did to him. And I don't know, I liked that element. It felt healthy, I guess you could say. Like, as healthy as someone can be from coming out of that situation. And it just, it felt, it felt realistic as much as a fairy tale retelling fantasy book can be. But it was just different, I guess you could say. It was just different from my typical read, the typical norm, that they did not save each other and that falling in love did not magically fix all their problems like we see so often. So I really appreciated that element. Now I get to read her brother's story, so now I'm excited about that one. <laughs> the main girl from book one, book three, is his story. So I finally get to read that now. So yeah, I liked it. More than I thought I would. Sarah was swearing to me that Tristan is redeemable. And I know he probably was, but I didn't really want to see it because I was still so annoyed at what he did in the first book. And to be fair, he's he's upset about what he did too. And that was, it was that almost repentance, I guess you could say, but with no Christian faith content in that regard, that he understood he messed up. He royally messed up. And he was trying to be able to forgive him. Other people had forgiven him, but what do you do when you can't forgive yourself is kind of the message of this book and I liked a lot of elements of it. There was two language, two usage of the A word in it so just a heads up for that and there is magic but overall not bad. Okay my battery is fixing to die so we're gonna try to do this last little bit. I reread one of my favorite like 
I love this book so much. This is The Mysterious Benedict Society by Trenton Lee Stewart. I love this book. I actually listened to the audiobook for the first time as I was doing some gardening projects and I'm actually in the middle of listening to book two. So, which is really weird. I don't think I've ever filmed a recent reads where I am in the middle of a book and I can't discuss it yet, but I'm in the middle of it, but I, I'm still really enjoying it. Obviously, it's The Mysterious Benedict Society. This series, this is my Roman Empire, if you will. <laughs> if we want to do that TikTok train, this is my Roman Empire, is the Mysterious Band Society. I think this was my sixth. I think I'm going to need to dump my sixth, but I swear I've read it at least seven times because I read this book prior to Goodreads multiple times, and I don't know how many times, so I'm thinking I've read it six or seven times. I adore this book. Don't, don't even get me started on the Disney Channel, the Disney Plus monstrosity did not cover the charm. This book is just wonderful. It's got that, oh, oh, I can't explain this book. Do you know about this book? Tell me you know about this book. I hope you know about this book. I just, look at that. Oh, you can't really see it. It's got their silhouettes though, and it's just, oh, it fits it so perfectly. I love this series. I love this series. I just, oh, forever five stars. Forever five stars. I just adore this, I have so many copies of this book, as y'all probably know. I own it in multiple editions. It is just such a special read, and it was so funny. This narrator was also really good. I think the narrator is Delroy. He's doing excellent. I was very impressed because I'm so picky on narrators, especially female narrators. This is a guy narrator, though, and I think that helped me like it better. And he just did the characters so well. Like, there's so many points that you could read like that they have an attitude or they're bratty, but I don't think that, I've never read it that way, but I've seen other people comment on it that way. And this author did, uh, the narrator did it just like it should be in my opinion, which is they're respectful, but they're curious. So they're gonna ask questions, but they're respectful and polite about it. Especially Rennie, I love him. So yes, adore this series, five stars forever. I love this book. I was actually quoting it along with him at multiple times as he's doing the narrator. There's Daisy. I actually was quoting a lot of lines and just adoring it. It made pulling weeds fun, y'all. It was just great. I just, I love, I love this book so much. So, so much. So that was my recent reads. I am getting quite warm. I feel like I've talked about so many books. Unfortunately, a lot of them were misses, which is disappointing. As far as the stack, obviously the mysterious Bandits of society stays. I may keep the Lost King's Daughter, I'm not sure yet. The other ones I probably won't be keeping. So that's like a um, pretty big unhaul right there for us. But I did read books off my physical TBR, which is great. As far as the Once Upon a February readathon, I didn't... I didn't film a reading vlog, y'all. I'm so sorry. I got so busy with gardening projects, and then when I wasn't working on gardening projects, I was feeling under the weather, so I just didn't get to it. So I thought real quick we could wrap up what books fit what prompt, because they were all discussed in this video. So for Red Rose, Red on the Cover, The Mysterious Mimic Society, A Fairy Tale Godmother, The Gender Flipped Retelling, just, uh, not Dust. Lady of Disguise, that's the one. Lady of Disguise counts for that one. As we just realized in this video, Merry Men, Male MC, I would say Hey Jude Carpenter, uh, Evil Stepmother, A Notorious Villain, A Lonely Dance, I think would totally count for that because the villain in this book just made you want to just whack him, like hard. Like not even a whack, a punch. Oh, he was terrible. Pixie Dust, A Magical Creature, A Goose Girl Had a Talking Horse, uh, Midnight, the last <laughs> last to read a book. This was Dust, because I was definitely behind. I feel like everyone's read this series. For Bluebeard, a lesser known retelling, I went with the um, A Steadfast Heart, The Steadfast Heart, because I had never heard of that one before. I think the Twelve Dancing Princess one could kind of count as well, because you don't see it that much, but I'm going to go with this one there. And then Wolf, an animal integral to the plot. I put Jude, Hey Jude Carpenter for this one as well because of the cows and the dairy farm element. And they're trying to, you know, save the dairy farm. I think that's pretty integral to the plot. A musical Voice, a book that incorporates music or singing. I don't feel like I have one where I can say 100% that was this. I mean, Hey Jude Carpenter, she really liked the music and the Beatles and even created him a CD playlist of songs, which was really cute, but... 
I don't feel like that really fully counts. Like nobody's saying. <gasps> no, wait, she did. No, her cousin did. Did she sing? I feel like I get half a point for that one. Regardless, I feel like I get half a point. I don't feel like I can count the whole book. Long Walks, A Girl with Long Hair, The Lost King's Daughter works for this. Snow Queen on a Quest, Lady of Disguise, or The Lost King's Daughter could fit for this. And then Thumbelina, a short book, I went with The Steadfast Heart because you could count them more than once, and that was like 130 pages. It was pretty little. So that was my wrap-up for that. I'm sorry I didn't get a, a recent read, uh, not a recent reads, this is a recent reads, a reading vlog out for that. I just honestly had a really hard time reading this month. All I wanted to do was be outside working in the garden stuff and that's what I really did and then I was feeling crummy for a couple weeks because of allergies and an allergic reaction so didn't really get too much reading wise. I mean I did pretty good. 12, 11, 10, 11 or 12 of these books I read in February so that's not too bad but it was a lot of books I really had to think about which I think also didn't help the fact that I didn't really want to read a lot because I kept having books that I'm really having to think hard about. So there was that. This was my stack of books. If we have different opinions on them, as always, it's okay to have different opinions. Just please be kind if you share them. I know I view things differently than a lot of people, but I also know there's a lot of people who have very similar thoughts as me, and that's great either way. We're just always kind to each other. That is the stack that I have physically for this video. I hope y'all enjoyed it. Hopefully all my rambles and rants and comments made sense. If they didn't, feel free to check out my full content reviews. Like I'm not telling you that because I want more views. I'm telling you because those I have particularly thought over and made sure they, fl they flowed and made sense. It's really way easier for me to do that in writing than speaking. So that's why I always suggest that if something's not clear or you want to know more content info, please check out my reviews. That would be really the best way. <laughs> that's it for this video though. I have talked y'all's ear off long enough. Hopefully, hopefully you enjoyed this video in my honest thoughts. Hopefully, I hope. <laughs> but I will see y'all next time. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know if you've read any of these. Do you love the Mysterious Venix Society? There's only one answer for this. Like, no pressure. There's only one. <laughs> we all have different opinions. I know I just said that, but I love this book. This is my childhood in a nutshell. I just love this series so much. I'm really enjoying listening to the audiobooks of it, but I will talk about those again, I'm sure, at a later date. So I will see y'all next time. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have an absolutely lovely rest of your day. I am Lindsay from the blog booksforchristiangirls.blogspot.com where there is a new review every Monday and Friday. I try to post a new video on this channel every Friday and then I'm also on Instagram and Goodreads and TikTok and all those many places. Feel free to hit subscribe and like if you enjoyed this video. Or you just appreciated my honest thoughts even, but it's okay if you don't. That's okay. We all have different thoughts, and I hope you have an absolutely lovely rest of your week. Bye!